All right. Welcome to webinar three. Um, pretty exciting that we, um, it, we, it feels like Thursdays just come up so quick <laughs> for Jamie and I. We sort of get sure to work this afternoon and go, crap, we've got it tomorrow. Um, but this week's episode um, is on easing the transition to online environments with the right tools. Um, so when we sat down to kind of think about what we were going to, what value is, we know that people often get quite overwhelmed by the ed tech tools out there. Um, and that can be sometimes something that's blocking or causing more stress than it needs to. So as always, my co-host, Jamie Engel. Uh, Jamie, do you want to just give you a quick intro to anyone who's new? Sure, sure. I'm the founder of Newtopia, which is a, an online learning and engagement platform that suits guided learning, self-guided learning, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Great, very succinct. Yeah. And yeah. I am Bianca Raby, the founder of OPEDA. We are a team of passionate educators trying to raise the bar in online learning globally through learning design as the core um, skill and way of doing that. I have a few team members on the call as well, which is fantastic. Um, and But we will kick, get started. So uh, the first question that came up when Jamie and I were discussing this is, and this is how we'll kick off today, uh, by the way, sorry, just some housekeeping, some Zoom keeping. If you have a question, um, you are very welcome to, um, to turn yourself off mute and, and try and ask it in the middle of what we're talking about. That's totally fine. This is a small group. Um, if you want to uh, just send it in the chat, Jamie will look at the chat when I'm talking and I'll look at the chat when he's talking. Um, and so we can interrupt each other to do that as well. Um, but we are going to jump straight into this one. So Jamie, this is for you. Um, if yep. you, it can be overwhelming with all the sub uh, uh, ed tech tools out there. So how do you decide what to use and when? Um, so I, I guess I'll share a little bit of, of my journey and why I created Newtopia, because that actually figures into creating a student experience. So when, when I started teaching in 2012, um, I got invited to be a teacher at Billy Blue College of Design, and it sounded like a terrifying thing to do. And so I said, yes, I was intrigued. And, but very quickly, I fell in love with teaching within a first few weeks, and I fell in love with the students. And um, I got very curious about their hopes and dreams and aspirations for the future. And um, we were using a traditional um, platform, uh, similar ones that used at most universities that deliver, deliver the learning where it's fairly uh, controlled. And, and um, I found myself wanting to share TED Talks. And in the process, I discovered it, it was not easy to do. So the platform wasn't that flexible. And so I was thinking about what, what is the student experience I'm trying to create? And I found myself thinking about, wow, I, I want it to be flexible. I want the students to be able to share information with each other, share their knowledge, share what they're finding on the web. It was 2012 at the time, and I'm thinking people are using Facebook, they're using um, Pinterest, they're using different platforms, they're used to using Spotify. I started experimenting with Slack, which we'll look at in a bit. But, but I was really coming at learning from, I want to create this great student experience that's dynamic, that's flexible, um, that is a bit less hierarchical and, and does allow for the peer-to-peer. -peer. It doesn't put me as the teacher in a, in a place up here. So, so I think with anyone thinking about the student experience, there's, there's just so many different types of learning experiences. There's being around a dinner table, sharing knowledge with your friends. That's a, that is a learning experience. Um, and there's reading books, there's watching TED Talks, there's watching the, that, the somewhat new masterclass to learn. Um, there's so many experiments happening now in all different types of student experiences. I think we've broken away from the time around when MOOC started to, to scalable big replacements to lecture hall experiences. So I really would start at, one of the first questions is, is thinking about what do I want the experience to be? And, I, and I'm not negating or, or challenging the very traditional. Um, I'm just saying it's a, it's a great place to start because you might find yourself going, oh yeah, like if I think about it, 
what other kinds of student experiences could I create? Even like, you know, you think field trips, when kids go on field trips, that's another kind of experience, going out into nature, going to a museum. So some of these also, as, as we're seeing with virtual experiences or virtual reality or virtual visits to museums, because a lot of them now have that, you know, you can even do stuff online. So I really would start thinking about maybe listing a, a few things, doing a little user journey, which is maybe something Bianca can talk about in, in the learning design aspect, but what is that experience? Um, so yeah, any questions on that? Nope, okay, cool. Um, second one. So we've got the learning experience, then the outcomes. So what are the outcomes? And again, if we think about the variety of outcomes, there's outcomes like learning a physical skill, like, like um, if you were learning how to sail a boat. Um, so an outcome is, is mastering that physical skill. There's intellectual outcomes. There's one that really fascinates me is, is the belief system outcome. I found myself, as, as I was, the, the terms were passing and I was thinking about learning design, I sort of, my background is in screenwriting and in storytelling, there's, there's the plot of the movie or the story and, and then there's the inner journey of the hero of the story. So the plot I would relate to, the outcome is Lord of the Rings, getting that ring back to Mordor. Mm -hmm. That is the plot, that's the goal that the hero and the fellowship have to, have to do. And so you're watching the hero do this outer plot where there's these obstacles in the physical world um, to do things. Then there's the inner journey and that's where all the interesting stuff happens. That's the belief system outcomes. And so if the parallel were from Lord of the Rings to learning, the transformational journey of the hero is getting through all the obstacles to get the ring back to Mordor or for Neo in the Matrix to, to take down the Matrix um, and battle the agents. But what we're really fascinated watching in any good movie or story is not so much the action on the outside, it's the action on the inside. And so the outcome for the student when they're hitting these obstacles in the learning journey sits around, what, what I found with my students, they were getting stopped around things like belief system things like I don't think I'm smart enough or I noticed with my design students what came up very early on when I said we'd be teaching finance in an entrepreneurship class they'd have memories of a teacher told me I'm not I'm not that good at math or you'll never be good at math and cast some spell on them that they believe they're not good at math and then we'd have to bust through that belief have them do a little bit good at math to where they were like oh I can do this and with business school students, I would find that they would think, I don't know how to draw. And they'd have mm -hmm. some memory that that doesn't look like a fire engine. So I think that outcomes, it's thinking, you wanna get some outcomes of a skill or an intellectual aspect of what they're learning. But I am more fascinated with the inner outcomes, how, how the student can transform as a human being, how they can shift their beliefs, their self-esteem, to know themselves as someone who's capable of so much more. And, and, and to if, have that type of transformation happen, um, that's exciting, I think. And relating that back to the technology piece, Jamie, because that's a beautiful explanation, is that sometimes we can actually put technology in that distracts from outcomes. And so that's why it's really key to really think about each decision that you make to put bells and whistles inside a course. So sometimes that could actually just take away from not add to. So if you're looking at, at, at the outcomes that Jamie's speaking about around this belief stuff, then you need to be thinking about how you can create a, these synchronous engagements. And synchronous can also be a chat where they've got instant feedback, a relationship building, how are you going to use the tools to create that relationship and that trust to be able to bust through those beliefs. Um, but going back to the tech, we can actually overwhelm students with um, way too many fluffy, fancy things. Thanks, Bianca. I'm, I'm laughing because I know what just happened there. I get so excited about <laughs> all of that like inner stuff and the psychology stuff and beautiful learning design. I forgot to <laughs> about it. 
Thank you. It's a bad so tech. It's okay. So, 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 it's still lovely so to listen to. I'm sure everybody's having, okay. <laughs> so good having you there, Bianca. I <laughs> that myself. Okay. Anyway, coming back to outcomes. Yes. Okay. So outcomes with the ed tech. So, so yeah, it would be thinking about what kinds of, of products, tools um, would help with whatever outcome or experience we're, we're trying to create. So I'd say in that there's, there's not gonna be any one right tool or a couple of right tools. I think there's a little bit of experimentation in the classroom mm -hmm. if, it, if it's possible. I know in the early days, um, before I created Newtopia, I tried Facebook groups. I was frustrated because things got lost in the chronology when students would share stuff. Then I tried Slack, which helped heaps for connection but also things would get lost. And, and if I made a new Slack team the next term, um, sometimes great information would be lost. So I think it's having a willingness to play around and experiment and see if you can get the tool to match the outcome that you're trying to um, aspire to. Okay, and then the last one, look for other great examples. Um, so examples of delivery that inspires you. So if you've been in a great course, back engineer it, consider, what tools they used, how they achieved it through the combination of the tool and the learning design. And I think um, seeing great examples um, and then being curious about how they achieved it and why they achieved it and what the tool was able to do if it's a new type of tool that you're using is, is a really great way. It's just looking at what other people do. Cool, and that's a really great segue because we're gonna do an activity now where we're gonna put you in breakout rooms. Um, so if you were on the call last week, we, we, we looked at how to do this. So we're actually going to do it again. Uh, and you're going to answer this question. So in your groups, share details about effective ed tech tool that you have used. It's also about the 15 minute mark of the webinar, which is exactly when you really should start to get some sort of active learning from the group. So we stop talking and we give people something to do. So this is practicing that um, little strategy as well. And also, so I'm going to do just uh, very randomized groupings. So you're just going to end up in a room with somebody in a minute. Um, and then I'll give a one minute warning and then pull you back into the main group to share. Last week, we didn't actually share what we spoke about. We just used it as an example. This week, we will share some of those tools. And then Jamie and I will add onto that the tools that we wanted to show you today in this webinar. Okay. Any questions? Cool. You're about to get kicked out of this room and into another one. Just give me one second. How long okay. are we going into the rooms for, Bianca? Uh, about five minutes. Let's just stop sharing for a second. Breakout rooms, I'm going to put, there's going to be three rooms, okay? One, two, three. Happy chatting.
Hi, Julian. Hello. Uh, my name is Bianca. I'm the host. We just have all the group in a breakout room at the moment. They're about to come back in. Okie dokie. So um, you're a new, we haven't seen your name before. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, Bianca. I'm a friend of Jamie's. Are you? Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm about to boot them all out of their rooms and they'll be all back in a second. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm in a really dark room, so there's no point turning on my camera. I'll see if I That's can all press some, some, some light and see how we go. Let's give you a sec. No worries. I accidentally left my friends. <laughs> I was going to say you're early. You just had a one minute warning. <laughs> and then I just pressed it and then I just okay. out of my room. Just did mid sentence. <laughs> uh, I think I can, I don't think I can send you back. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Student. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. They'll come back in a sec. When they come back, yeah. <laughs> and I can't message individual rooms, which is a bit annoying. I wonder if. Oh, that's I thought. All oh, right. Okay. I do wonder if I just need to do an update of Zoom at some point. I think I tried to update the other day. It asked me if I wanted to, but I don't know if it did it. So. Ah, well, yeah. Remember last time I I was asking you about reactions and I couldn't find it, but the update has given me reactions now. Oh, that's good. Okay. Ah, everybody's coming back. Lovely. Oh, hi, David. Yes, David has been here. He just joined. Awesome. Oh, awesome. And back. Mary, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Belinda didn't mean to boot herself out. <laughs> it's okay. Left and slammed the door. Sorry. Nice, nice. Cool. Hi, David. Uh, and um, Julian just joined as we were in the breakout rooms. Jamie, he's a. Hi, Julian. Yours? A friend of mine. Hello. Hi, Hi, Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. So let's um let's go through and share. I'm going to take some notes uh, of the platforms that you guys talk about, and then um, we will put them in a list somewhere. So um, maybe we'll start with your group, Belinda. This what was the uh, conversation there? Yeah. Um, Mari, did you want to go first? Sure. Oh, okay. I was uh, talking of the use of polling as an um, effective engagement um, tool, and also just um, feeling like I was part of the the whole presentation and having confirmation of the, the learning point. Mm -hmm. And Angela says, I missed yours, sorry. That's right. We use the Padlet and the tools that people can collaborate online, such as uh, wikis and uh, Google Docs. Yeah, wikis. Uh, do you use a particular platform for wikis or do you just run it through the, the management system? Which university is often depends. Yeah. Depends. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Belinda, did you have anything else? I just talked about um, good video content, but I have seen really effective use of the interview format because I think a conversation oh, yeah. is um, often a much richer uh, opportunity for learning than a one face talking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Oh, but Belinda, awesome. we, we had mm -hmm. a, a question. Someone was asking if anyone knew of good video um, editing tools. Is there anything that you use? Oh, uh, I couldn't answer that. I was, I was thinking more about actually the courses that I've been part of. Um, okay. Yeah, so no, I'm not a video expert. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, Aaron, did you just post in the chat. Did you want to go next for your group? Panopto is a good tool. It's super expensive, but it's probably oh, enterprise. It? Yeah, it's really expensive. You got like, it's my dream to use it one day, but mm -hmm. you know, it's for enterprise, but it is very cool. Mm -hmm. But you can talk to it if you like. Yeah, so I primarily use Moodle as my LMS and um, I use a lot of the different features that you can use that are built right within Moodle. So that includes like mm -hmm. quizzes and other interactive knowledge checks so that I like those because the students 
can get a lot of immediate feedback on their mastery of the content. They're, they're time consuming to build on the front end, but I tend to get really positive feedback about those types of things. Um, you can build wikis and have the students do um, contribute to some sort of activity together. I use discussion forums. Um, and then I use Panopto to record video lectures and um, I just do really basic editing, but it seems like there's a whole boatload of things you can do with Panopto that I don't even know how to do. Um, so those are all different things I use along with Adobe Connect to run virtual classrooms instead of Zoom. And Adobe Connect has a, a little bit more functionality in terms of a polling feature where you can put little quiz questions up on the screen, you can use a whiteboard, you can share a PowerPoint, share a screen, you can share multiple PowerPoints simultaneously using little pods and blocks. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what I use most often. Cool. Thank you. And other people from Erin's group? I think we're both waiting for the other person to speak. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't have much to add to the conversation. I must admit, uh, I've been enjoying the whiteboarding feature, which is been coming out a bit more recently in uh, content meetings, able to clarify uh, points and add a visualization elements. So, uh, Alyssa? Whiteboard feature in Zoom, yes. Uh, and Moto is one that I use as an actual teacher before, but it's pretty limited, it's more just for students, some parent communication. Um, can, there's a quiz feature, um, having to find assignments turned in digitally. Um, there's a lot of free options with that one. Yeah. Did you ever use Kahoot quizzes? Because it's targeted a lot at school teachers. Kahoot. No, I'm teaching them. At least in Tokyo, we didn't use that. Cool. And who, your group, Jamie? Uh, we had a few things. Uh, so, Brad, what was the ones you mentioned? iSpring? iSpring is a, a new one that um, I've started using with um, another feature. Um, very interactive. You're allowed, you can take an image and, and put um, sort of little um, particular target spots. You, you click on that, it'll take you to a quiz. It might take you to a video. Um, and the other one that's really blown my mind in the last month is, is um, the 360 camera and software. Um, it's amazing. My wife's an environmental educator and she uses it in the environmental education centre and they'll do set, um, uh, you know, year 11 science and they'll be walking around the facility and they're able to do sort of um, leaf counts and shade counts. They'll be able to do quizzes on site. So 360 and the software is something I'm now starting to experiment with, particularly with a lot of, a lot of extra classes having to go online. Mm. Oh, what's it actually called? Is it called 360 camera? Is that what? So, so, so it's a 360 camera. So it takes an image of oh, a 360. Yeah, so you buy the camera and the software. Right. So you set the camera okay. up and it'll take a 360 image. And then wherever you go in those set locations, it shows you the site and you can do quizzes and activities. You can incorporate videos. It's it's absolutely amazing. State of the art. Very cool. Sounds fun. I love it. Yeah, it is. You can get really creative. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> sure. And there were a couple other in the group. What was... David and Spice. Yeah, um, we yeah we we uh, we the, the tool we mainly use the 360 cameras in June at the moment, and we all just re uh, recently uh, start to use the OneNote um, for people to demonstrate um, the lectures and make uh, notes uh, in in the Zoom, and also Kahoot and Bianca just mentioned uh, we just introduced this week in the lectures. Uh, be uh, likely to have a game and have multiple. Uh, they can use that to quizzes and, and students like that too. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, mm. Spice. Yeah, and I also yeah. didn't have uh, loads to add, but I've um, done a bit of work using kind of the embedded features on Canvas quizzes and um, discussion, that kind of thing. Yeah, cool. Angelos, did you have anything? Sorry, we haven't heard from you. 
Um, Let's speak in the beginning. I mentioned the collaborative documents, wikis, Padlet. Oh, you did, sorry. By the, way, by the way, there's a University of New South Wales course on teaching online, and they have uh, collected uh, they had thousands of students and they used an Excel sheet to uh, list all the software that people found useful. I might be able to send you the, the link to that if you're interested. That's fabulous. Started. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. But then when you get a list that big, it still becomes an effort to go through the list. <laughs> but yes, I absolutely appreciate that. How big um, I think. How big was the How big? Uh, it's got uh, resources for each one of the units, each one of the uh, modules. Uh, it's big. I'll okay. just give you a link. It's easy. It's on uh, Google Docs. Uh, okay. Google. Cool. I was just curious. Yeah. Play with it. Yeah, yeah. The EdTech uh, space has been fairly crowded with exciting ideas, um, which is actually a really good segue to um, the next section. Jamie, did you have anything to add to that conversation? Uh, no. No. Nope. Um, so we are at half past two. Jamie, did you want to do um, some a quick share of Utopia just to show some of the features and tools that you yep. built into the LMS? Um, yep. But we're also going to just speak quickly to the Slack and Trello as tools that we've used that Jamie's used, and then I was just going to show a little bit of Padlet in case people haven't seen that before. So that should take us through. Okay. Okay, so just just to show a variation of hopefully a different way of thinking about um, learning. As I said at the start, I, I got very excited when I started teaching, and I was thinking a lot about how to how to create a bit more intrinsic motivation and curiosity. So I'd say really my starting point was how do I create more curiosity for my students? How do I get them curious to learn? And I know I was watching and still watch so many TED Talks and conference talks and I was a little frustrated that I couldn't share that content. And I, I tried with Slack and Facebook groups at the start and they were very good, but, but I kept thinking there was other things I wanted to do. And the model that I thought seemed the most relevant was something like Spotify. I kept thinking, God, I, I wish there was something that were a bit like Spotify for knowledge that had those features. So the, the other platform I was looking a lot at just for my own learning platform, um, totally recommend it if you don't know it. So medium.com. So most of these are uh, typical. And so in this community, the landing page is whatever is the latest content being shared and people can share into the learning community or the team. Um, it could be just a, a talk on YouTube, so like a TED talk, and you would just put in the URL and add it, or you can upload content. So really, if, when I was at Billy Blue College of Design, I was thinking, God, you've got a thousand students across the entire college all finding and saving documentaries and conference talks and examples of typography and UX design, if they were all putting it into one big digital library, that would be a pretty good library. And then if it's organized by tags, you could just click on something like storytelling. The digital version of the university or school library. Then anyone can add that content into a playlist similar to um, similar to Pinterest. So I might do storytelling and then that would create a new playlist that I could add to. I can follow anything that's a tag and that will personalize my landing page feed a bit like Facebook groups. And then also the, the taxonomy starts to know what's being added that what are the next door neighbors. So if you're in a school library and you're in storytelling, future storytelling and brand storytelling might be next door neighbors. And it also will show collections um, of that kind of content. 
So I could go right next door and here's some future storytelling and then here's other things that are next door neighbors of that. So it starts to cluster content around topics. Mm. On my Can I just add to that? Sorry, just two seconds, Jamie. I just want to link that into something that I'm really passionate about with clients is to really um, use the learning management system that you have chosen to its maximum first and then try and bring in other things on top of it. So Jamie created Newtopia with social learning being at the core and so therefore the design of that, so that software has been created for this type of experience. This isn't common. Um, most of the standard learning management systems out there do not create haven't been created for social learning and so what jamie's done is that's his niche in the market but there are tools that you can bring into those other systems that can try and do some of this stuff um, but again just realizing that whatever the, mo the motivation was for the original design is going to be what that system has got as a as a, i guess as a lack and so that's where we need all these other things to plug in yeah exactly um, so I would complement Newtopia with Slack because they do fairly different things as far as the way the communication happens. Um, on the profile page, it's whatever content a student has saved to the platform. So it starts to build the personal library. You could bookmark other people's content. You can make a collection of content. So here's that storytelling collection that I made just before. Um, the courses and the projects and also the people that I follow, the topics that I follow and the people that followed me. So a social network and, and a topic network. And then the last area, if I go into a course, we're going from self-guided learning in the library to guided learning. And in a, a course, which is a contained community, there's an activity feed similar to a Facebook group where everyone in the class you could speak to and you can at mention the different people in the class or everyone. So the, a little bit of communication, the projects in the class. So that could be shared project-based learning. It could be individual projects, group projects. And then in the context of the class, the playlist is the curriculum. And, and I thought really content, a collection of content is a playlist a collection of playlists is a course and a playlist being module one, two, three, um, week one, two, three, um, great website building tools. And then if I go into one of the modules, it just is the playlist of the videos, articles, wiki pages that you can move through. And it could be 100% curated from the web um, I tend to curate a lot of content like the TED Talks, or it could be 100% IP that a learning designer or a school creates. So I guess the last thing I'll leave you with on this, how does this, how does this create curiosity? My thinking was that if someone finds a topic or a person they like, like, like Rachel Botsman or collaborative business models, which is what she's talking about in that TED Talk, they could search for it and end up back in the open library. So I was trying to get a seamless student learner experience between the guided learning where you would be in a class, you discover a great author, a great lecturer, um, and you wanna go into the library. So really the digital equivalent of being in your physical class, finding someone great, walking down to the librarian and saying to them, hey, do you have any other any other books on Rachel Botsman or collaborative consumption, collective economy mm -hmm. type topic or storytelling. So really getting that movement between the guided area and the self-guided and letting students share with one another. Which has also raised a really interesting um, point. I'll just put, and I think most people on this call would understand this, that the role of the educator has definitely started to become more of a curator than a content creator. And I mm. say to people now, content is not key, curation is. Um, and that what we really need to do is, is provide that um, structured learning journey. We know our students are overwhelmed with communication distractions. We are ourselves overwhelmed with communication distractions. Just before this call, Jamie and I were both sharing that we're a little bit ugh, with information right now. We don't think we can take much more in. <laughs> and, you know, that's a constant feeling, uh, I think, among most people who are digitally connected nowadays and, and do spend a, a fair chunk of their time on the phone or on the internet. And so as educators, 
you know, we've really got to curate that path for them so that they don't get too distracted and get off track. And but they de- but they also are able to kind of be part of that journey too. So that's why Newtopia is such a is a really interesting platform in the market because it has taken that idea of curation to another level and it's allowing that student to have that autonomous say. Now, most people are working in Moodle, Blackboard, Canvas, more of the stock standard LMSs. That's where the design piece comes in. That's where I get excited because I go, okay, you've got this system, but how can we do bits of what Jamie's done here and try and recreate those scenarios inside that system? So maybe we'll just open up to questions, Jamie, unless you want to add to anything about that. If anyone has any questions, please. Nothing? Cool. I have a question. Sure. Go, Liz. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, when you've like chosen a tool, what would the, you suggest uh, best practices for implementing it across your team or organization for those who are going to be new to it? Um, so I didn't get all the words. What did you say? <laughs> no, Thailand internet. She's a <laughs> go again, Liz. What is best practice? but implementing a new ed tech tool across your team or organization for those who are new to it? Oh uh, gosh, um, I'll, I'll take a punt at this, but I reckon Bianca has more knowledge in, in the implementation. Um, I, I would say what, what I've found at different unis I've worked with is probably not enough time on the professional development side. So I think a lot of, whether it's the learning designer or the teacher, a little bit more than the students, not having enough time being upskilled on a new methodology, a new process or a new tool, um, or even a new style of teaching. So I think it's really, with any change management, it's getting the sign on of the people that are having to change their habits, getting them to understand why it's exciting. I think really looking for the benefits, like this might seem difficult and time consuming at the start to change tools or change methods, but it's gonna save you so much time once you get used to it. And I think for all humans, changing any kind of habits hard, but getting sign on and then really supporting that transition and having people understand what is the benefit they're going to get from that change. Yep. Could you add yes, I'll just add, yeah, I'll just add um, that it's super important with technology in general. So even if this is talking just about your, you know, maybe you're just migrating or changing LMSs. So going from one to another, you've got to find your early adopters and your champions early. So you've got to find, identify the ones in your organization that are really comfortable with technology and the ones that you're going to spend the time on first getting them up to speed because then the work you do with them is going to dribble down to the rest of the organization and have and and think of people in categories because they are going to have different attitudes around adoption and so giving them support along the way to adopt in the way that works for them and not assuming sort of one especially if you're talking large organizations one sort of size fits all okay everyone comes to this one training and then we all get started um, there's, there'll be people that will have so much anxiety about being thrown in the deep end with the technology that they don't understand. Um, and so just really appreciating that different style, I think, is important. I'm just going to jump on to Trello to show you this really quickly. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so I tend to use Trello for doing pre-visualization of learning journeys, learning design. Um, if you don't know it, it, it basically is a card-based digital system. So I could create a bunch of cards like module one or week one, create another one, module two or week two. Um, you can drag them very easily and start to create a, a learning journey. So if, if I did, let's see, welcome, module one, module two, I could then create cards here, welcome to the course, um, video about that, article about that, a task, um, and so on. So, so I find that really good because I like to see everything really simple, like a rough draft, because I can see the whole journey. It it's probably comes a little bit from my screenwriting background using index cards. 
Um, and then you can easily reorder them and go, oh, that's starting to seem like that, that week one is a bit long compared to week two. And can this move there? I can move this over, move that over. I find that a really, really quick way to build out learning design. Um, and then the other thing we want to quickly show you was Slack. Do you want to bring up? Yeah, I just uh, I just turned it off so that it wouldn't ding the whole way through this. So I'll just turn it back on again. <laughs> Is the train off free for the basic entry uh, use? Trello. Mean? Yeah, Trello. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm. It's free, and then there's add-ons that. Mm -hmm. that uh, you can add different things to it, and that costs money, I believe. Mm. It looks like a little bit like uh, the Padlet, but they they yeah. Bianca just showed me that one before the call, so we were going to show that as well. It mm. does. Yeah, mm. Padlet is um. So this is Slack. I just this is my Easter message to the team, <laughs> so everybody mm. can see our live Slack. <laughs> this is my favorite meme going around right now. <laughs> Debating where we go for Easter, the living room or the bedroom. Um, so, <laughs> so this is uh, this is like, you know, we, we use it to. Um, the, these are all channels, so these are all projects, project teams. So not everybody's in all these channels. I'm in all of the channels, obviously, but um, they people get assigned to each channel that if they're working on a team. And then there's also a whole bunch of private messages that you can send as well. So, and you can create own little, see these are little teams that have popped up that are not formal teams. Um, but Slack's a great way to have groups working together. Um, you can obviously upload memes, photos, all that kind of jazz. So that's what we use to collaborate, but I would also use it for students to, it's sort of like a WhatsApp, you know. It's also, and I'll add, um, I've used it in the university setting when there were external mentors for a university course and they couldn't, um, get registered onto the the learning system mm -hmm. for various security reasons. So it's a good workaround to use Slack because then all the students can be on it as well as the teachers and the mentors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great point. And this is Padlet that we just spoke about. So Padlet has all these different options. So walls, canvas, streams, grids, timelines, maps, back channel. I haven't played with them all, I have to be honest. Um, but what we have done is just show you this is a canvas. Um, and it allows you to do all sorts of things like moving. It seems to be a Trello that with heaps more movement. So you can have all these different options to do with the tool. Um, and you can create da, 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 using wow. yeah, all of these different things. Upload link, Google, Snap, Film, voice recording, draw, et cetera, et cetera. And then this one was, it allowed me to take a picture using my, my camera on the, on the computer and then just upload it straight to a card. So, and it's, you can share. So Jamie has access to this board. Good job, Jamie. Nice demo. And he can, um, he can then share and add things and we can change colors by the looks of things. And I'm sure there's a whole bunch of stuff that I haven't figured out yet, but super fun. Anything's possible. Anyone got any um, experience with Padlet they want to share? Uh, some real examples of how they've used it? Um, uh, I have, have used Padlet. Di di uh, different groups, they can put notes of the discussion um, notes there and then bring people back and everybody can see their discussion notes. Ah, notes, okay. Mm. Yep. Yeah, we used it, uh, we did an exercise asking uh, professors what do they think their, the characteristics of a successful lecturer mm. are. And each one had to post a little uh, blurb there. Just saying, listing what they thought there was, and they could see nice. each other. So there was no cooperation. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like the sticky note wall that you have when you're facilitating. You know, all good ideas go up onto the Padlet or whatever, or you can collaborate that way. I haven't I haven't really played with it in real time, so um, I was hoping to get Matt our more techie ed tech on 
to talk about it, but he couldn't make it today. <laughs> any other any other tools anyone wants to talk about in detail this has sparked you to think about? Hey, Bianca, do you want me to ask the questions of you? I think we've covered all that, Jamie, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was really going to just talk to um, just researching options and really kind of getting that hands-on experience with it. I think I actually might have mentioned this even in the first webinar that it's really important to try and get a free trial and play first because they can do all the marketing spin in the world. But if you try and use the tool and it doesn't really do what you thought it was going to do, um, yeah, super important to go through that trial period and um, speak to people who have used it in real time. training or learning um, are you able to elaborate on, on on what that was please yeah just I've been looking for the links uh, while you guys are talking I found the link I'm gonna post the links in a couple of minutes uh, excellent in the chat uh, space there I'll, I'll post the link to the course and I'll post the link to the resources which I found and there's thousands of them but they're grouped so they're good just awesome. I'm actually minutes. just going to post my notes from that from that discussion we just had. I'm just posting them in the chat now as well. So they're not very well articulated. They were very much notes. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, guys, I found another great uh, resource. The University of uh, New South Wales again. They have a few tables on the website, and I'm going to post it where they list uh, what do you want to do, what are the learning outcomes. Here are the tools that you can, that you can use. And they're not exhaustive, it's just a selection of the best ones. So I think you love them. Awesome. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Good. Yeah, check out the chat, everybody, and take some copy and paste if you want to grab that information. Uh, Quality Matters is a good um, organization. You've been doing some learning design courses, Aaron, since you've <laughs> stuck inside. <laughs> Any um, golden nuggets from them that you want to share around this choice of technology? <laughs> Pick accessible technologies. Hold the providers or the creators of new technology accountable for designing for people with disability. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just improve the experience for students with disability. Accessible technology improves the experience for everyone. So I'm a big proponent of um, access, online accessibility. Um, so really look for that. Look for the, uh, the creator's accessibility statement and hold them accountable for that. Nice one. That is true. Very, very true. Awesome. So that's a Google Doc. Has everybody been able to grab that link from Angelos? Thank you for that. Mm. Ah, an even better one. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> it's a selection of the best ones and according, aligning with learning objectives. What do you want to do this? So here are the, here are the best tools that we can use with you. Fantastic. Really great. What a legend. Thank you. But that, uh, that course that I'm talking about, the University of New South Wales, excellent. Uh, I mean, Yankas is excellent too. I'm doing it. But this, there's another one. <laughs> <laughs> nice plug. I didn't yeah, pay him I like to say that. that. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is there is some yeah, there's some good stuff out there. Awesome. Thanks for those links. Um, all right, well we have five minutes to go, which means we're kind of finishing on time, which is amazing. Jamie, do you have any parting words? Um, and if everyone can just make sure they take all these links out of the chat now, uh, knowing we're gonna shut down in a minute. Um, yeah, no, I'm just an absolute pleasure to have everyone here. I love chatting about this stuff. So it's so great to have so many people on the call. Absolutely. Anyone else got any parting words of wisdom? Thank you, guys. Ah, pleasure. Mm. Thanks, Julian. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Jamie, are you based in the U.S.? No, I'm here in Australia. Oh, you're in Australia. I'm like here. I don't know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was in Bali, yeah. from Thailand, I yeah, think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In Australia. Yeah. Most of Sydney, too. Yeah. You can't be here, Jamie, because I'm here. <laughs> I'm, uh-huh. here. <laughs> I'm also there. Yeah, yeah, you're there and I'm here, okay? Exactly. <laughs> Um, yes, everybody's where they are. Just uh, just plugging next week. If you want to tell everybody, tell all your friends. Uh, it's our last one in this series, and then we're going to regroup and think about next series. This is around creating connection and community. Um, so some of the stuff we, is a little bit of overlapping across the weeks, but there's a theme every time, and that's around the community side of things. So we'll probably talk more about some of these tools that do that community aspect. Hey, hey, while I've got everyone, is there, is, I'm so curious, is there um, anyone that has any interesting questions or topics that you would love to have us chat about? Mm-hmm. I'm always interested Ooh. in hearing people's thoughts on getting student buy-in, because what I find okay. challenging sometimes is that when I when I design more interactive learning activities where the students are dependent on other students to complete the task, Mm -hmm. those activities tend to get rated less favorably than the activities that students can do um, on their own. And I don't know if it's a facilitation problem. I I don't know if it's just that people want to work at their own pace and so having to wait for somebody else is annoying, but something around that and maybe that you'll talk about, about that next week if the topic's related to collaboration uh, okay cool that's really helpful there's um we could talk about that next week and i'll just tell you now there's a really okay. interesting study that google did on um what made the best performing teams the best performing teams and uh it, if you look up uh project aristotle and there's a new york times article about it and what they found was that, you know, they checked all sorts of things, gender, background, grades, where they went to school, and it came down to psychological safety, that I, I feel safe and I trust the people on my team, that they have my back and that I feel mm. supported. That's not everything, but that's an interesting starting place is the power of psychological safety. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Right. Good one. I think that's, that'll be a really good, I think we start with that next week, Jamie, because that's the centre of that collaboration piece. I think we uh, go down that path. All right. Happy Easter, team. Um, doesn't mean that you can't eat chocolate for breakfast just because you can't go camping. So happy eating chocolate for breakfast. Um, it's the one day of the year that it's totally okay to do that without guilt. Um, Easter Sunday in our house was always chocolate for breakfast day. But um, do whatever it is that you need to do to take a break from all these webinars. But we really appreciate your time today and joining the call, especially especially our fans. We've got a couple of um, people who've been here every week, which is fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, and Bianca. Thank you, thank you, Bianca and Jamie. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's great. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Happy Bye. Easter, everybody. Bye. Bye. See you, Bye. See you Bye. Jamie. Bye. See you, Lisa. Lisa. <laughs>